Good evening. I am the Reverend Terrence Melvin, and I'm honored to be the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CBTU, we've been in the trenches of the Black liberation struggle for nearly 50 years. We spoke truth to Nixon and Reagan, marched against the racist regime in South Africa, campaigned for Harold Washington, Jesse Jackson, and yes, Barack Obama. We have embraced the just struggles of native people and Palestinians. We have wept as we helped survivors of Hurricane Katrina and other national disasters. We've marched to protest the senseless murders of our sisters and brothers like Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. We've joined hands in solidarity with our sisters and brothers in Canada and England, organizing CBTU across borders. That's who we are, CBTU proud, independent and progressive. I'm excited tonight to host the first podcast in CBTU's new podcast series, which we have named Labor Shift. Labor Shift is CBTU's response to the moment we find ourselves in right now, a time when we are under siege from all sides, a killer virus, a deranged president, a tanking economy, a white racism that takes black lives, whether jogging or sleeping. Labor shift will be a place where we can engage in respectful debates while supporting each other in our local social justice work. That means we won't bite our tongue or do dodge the difficult conversations that America and the labor movement need to be having right now, even in the midst of a health crisis and a presidential election. Y'all know me and I'm gonna keep it real and I'm gonna tell it like it is. As host, my goal is bigger than just having great guests and lively conversations. With your engagement, we intend to shift how we frame issues, ideas, and people. Our black experience in America in the American democracy is unequal and unique. Events and disasters hit us harder and longer, which make our point of view even more relevant and needed. This podcast will amplify our voice and our leadership to a wider audience at a critical moment. So for our first broadcast, it seemed natural and timely to peek behind the mask of COVID-19 myths and get a deeper understanding of what black families, communities, and businesses face, and how best we can weather this global pandemic. I want to introduce, introduce a young man who stayed in my ear about upping CBTU's social media game. Peyton Wilkins is the executive director of CBTU's Education Center and the person who has the idea for this program. Peyton, I really appreciate your enthusiasm and hard work. So if you would say a few words about our program, Understanding COVID-19. Hit it, hit it, Peyton. Thank you, President Melvin. Hello to everyone out there. Um, so I, I want to start this on a somber note and talk about the underdevelopment of our community, the restriction of agency, the practice of medical apartheid, and the critical history of inequity expressed through policy. African Americans are facing a genocide on proportions unbeknownst to our communities. 78% of African Americans live within 30 miles of polluting facility. 23.5 million Americans live in food deserts. The defunding of public recreation centers, the defunding of public health care programs have all contributed to this crisis attacking our people. And examining these variables through the framework of environmental justice, we can gain insight into the matrix of disaster plaguing us right now. For example, Pre-existing conditions with the highest chance of death are a result of COVID-19 are um, pre-existing conditions that exist in our community. For example, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, abnormal high blood pressure, and cancer. You can see in this graph how all of these ailments increase the likelihood that an individual will die from COVID-19.
Also, um, it's important to understand that as we uh, examine these different conditions, that we can uh, see the impact that having multiple conditions can have on your um, chances of, uh, of, of living and surviving through COVID-19. So um, it is a, a very uh, uh, a startling situation that we need to address as a community and as a people. And um, as we think about other examples of deadly viruses in comparison to this virus like Ebola and the norovirus, and we can see how uh, contagious those viruses were and the difference in how they impacted our community then and now, the only thing that we can do is question what has systemically changed. So throughout this podcast, we'll be exploring these nuances and more. We encourage you to participate in the chat room on YouTube and submit questions that we will try to answer later in the broadcast. Tonight's podcast will feature two short presentations from special guests, followed by questions straight from the front lines um, and, and myth busters involving COVID-19. We'll wrap up with some more questions from the front line and the audience. Now, President Melvin will introduce our guest for tonight. Thank you so much, Peyton. Our first guest is like royalty in the CBTU family. Everybody loves Lula Odom, including me. Lula was one of those people when I first took over as president, she got on the phone and called me and said, what can I do to help? What can I do to help move CBTU in the direction that we need to be going in? So Lula, I wanna thank you for that and thank you for being a friend and a supporter throughout the years. Whenever Lula calls or texts, I know it's something positive and good for the people. I'm proud to say that she is a voluntary national labor liaison for CBTU's care team. For the past 12 years, Lula has been the lead training instructor for her union, ICWUC. She is renowned, renowned in the world of health and safety training. Welcome Lula to our debut bar broadcast. Lula. Thank you. Um, I'm quite honored to be here, to be uh, one of the first guests for what I know is gonna be a great adventure uh, with folks tuning in to find out what's going on with CBTU. So I wanna talk about um, the fact, number one, I've been with CBTU for 27 years, a very long time. So it's like my other family outside of my family in Detroit. So I wanna talk a little bit about the virus. Uh, we have a training program that we do through the International Chemical Workers Union. So we wanna go over a few slides that we have from a complete training that we have uh, for trainers. Uh, it's an introduction to the COVID-19 disease and it's presented again by the International Chemical Workers Center for Worker Health and Safety Education. It's a consortium of 10 other international unions and or groups. So this presentation is important to know it's funded by a grant through the National Institute of Environmental Health and Sciences awarded to us. And this content is strictly for educational purposes only for the benefit of our consortium par partners. It's not intended to provide medical advice or diagnosis. And I wanna say also that all of the images are found on public websites and they can be credited. So first of all, it's important to know that employees have a responsibility to you as a worker. The Occupational Safety and Health Act requires that employers provide you a workplace that is safe and helpful and free from recognized hazards and that they follow the protocols of the OSHA standards. Anywhere where there's not a specific standard, we have something called the General Duty Clause that catches everything else so that you are in a workplace that is free from recognized hazards. The employer also has a responsibility to provide you with training, uh, to have an emergency response plan, and also to keep records of any accidents or mishaps that may happen at the workplace. Even some of our standards require medical examinations. For example, if you've got to wear any kind of PPE over your face, uh, such as um, a face piece. You have a responsibility as well. You have a right 
to participate in the development and implementation of the employee safety and health policies. You have a right to help ensure that they are appropriate and implemented in a way that all workers benefit from it. This includes the use of all required gear and equipment, also following safe work practices and reporting any hazardous conditions on your work site. So let's talk a little bit about this virus. There are a lot of different kinds of uh, coronaviruses. Matter of fact, the common cold is one um, of one of the types of coronavirus. Just like AIDS, hepatitis B, colds, flus, just like trees, you got different kinds of trees, but at the root of it, they all look like trees until you look at the differences. So it's the same thing with this coronavirus. It's very different from a cold. This time, as you can see by the numbers, a lot of people die from it if you don't follow certain protocols. So some of the characteristics, antibiotics is ineffective on this particular virus. It may work on other viruses. Right now, there are no treatments. They're working on it. They came up with a couple today, I heard, but they're not mentioning what it is. But it might be a long time before they get any vaccine that's gonna help us. Right now, human beings have no immunity to this particular virus. How spread could it be? Well, on March the 11th in 2020, the World Health Organization, WHO, characterized the COVID virus as being a pandemic. That means this spread out through a lot of different countries. The approximately the United States recognizes about 197 countries. Of that 197 countries, 180 of them have been impacted by the COVID-19. So it's not unique to the United States. This is very widespread. If you can see, it goes throughout the whole world. So let's look at some stats. Uh, these particular figures that you see today came from um, the website that we had from March 30th. I would give you the updated numbers now. On a global scale, we have over 3 million people, 3,705,907 cases. Of that, 256,651 people have died. In the United States, as of yesterday, we had a little over a million people that have already had the COVID-19. Of that, there was a little, little over 71,000 have died. It's important to know, we talk about the death rates and the amount of cases, but of those over 1 million cases, 356,383 of them thankfully have survived. Looking at Spain, the numbers now as of yesterday, 278,188, 27,709 deaths of that number, 150,000 of those have recovered. Italy, 225,886 cases, 32,000 of those have died. 127,326 have survived. France, 179,927. Of that, 28,239 deaths, 61,728 have survived. So across the world, April 30th in the United Kingdom, these again are numbers from April 30th. As of today, there were 248,818 cases in the UK. 35,341 have died. In Germany, 177,728, 8,168 deaths. Turkey, 158,499. And Russia, 290,678. Of that, 2,837 have succumbed to the COVID virus. 
So let's look at the stats at home. The United States, there are 1,064,832 cases of that 61,680 deaths. In New York, April 30, if you see, they had a little, little over 306,000. As of today, there were 355,000 cases, 28,168 deaths. In New Jersey, as of today, 143,000, 10,356 deaths. Massachusetts, 86,010. 5,797 deaths. And finally, Illinois, 94,191, 4,177 as of today. Now, many states are opening back up. These numbers are expected to go up a little bit more. And then finally, just sort of hopefully, as they call, flatten the curve. So what can you do? You can be informed. You can follow the protocols of your state, which is really important, and go over and above that. Keep yourself safe. Wash your hands on a regular basis. And in washing your hands, make sure that you also hydrate them again, because with all of the washing of the hands, they get pretty dried out. So you need to get something really good to make sure you're moisturizing properly. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And that's why they're saying if you use the face piece not only you're protecting others from what you're breathing out, but you're also protecting yourself from inadvertently touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth and getting a transmission that way. By all means, please stay home if you're sick. And if you're going to work, if you're one of those essential workers, review your workplace exposure control plan. Practice the social distancing of at least six feet and be sure that you're safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lula, for kicking off our conversation with facts and truth. We welcome comments and questions from folks watching. This program is a place where we can all learn and share and grow into a powerful community with the influential voice. Just wanna let everybody know that we are gonna have a conversation. We have one more presenter that's gonna bring us some fascinating information that we need to know. And then we're going to have an opportunity to have some questions and conversation with these uh, two brilliant, three brilliant people that we have here today. Uh, my next guest is a bad brother, Roy McAllister. Uh, we get a, a fist bump from me just because he works with Lula. That's all it takes, man. Anybody work with Lula, you got to be good. Roy worked as a Detroit firefighter for 19 years, where he went from being a frontline fire fighter to the position of Lieutenant Training Instructor at the Detroit Fire Training Academy. After leaving the Detroit Fire Department, he became involved with CBTU, best choice of his life, as a care team member in 2007. That relationship blossomed into him becoming a trainer with the International Chemical Workers Union Council. In 2016, Roy joined the staff as the first African-American male instructor in the history of the ICWUC. He currently serves as a liaison for the United Food and Commercial Workers and the American Federation of Government Employees. Roy, the mic is yours. Thank you, President Melvin. Uh, I really do appreciate that, that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I don't know who wrote it, but they did a really good job on uh, giving that information. <laughs> Um, I also want to say thank you, and I'm honored to be here uh, this evening as a part of this program, uh, which is especially important because of the impact that it's having on everyone uh, in our lives. And then I also want to say, as you said, I made one of the best decisions in my life by joining CBTU, and that was by virtue of our great friend here and, and the queen that she is known as Lula Odom. Um, through her, I was able to come into CBTU and get involved in the CARE team, which spawned me to uh, come on board with the International Chemical Workers Union Council, and I have not regretted one moment of it since, and, and I thank you all very much for allowing me to be here. Uh, so I just want to go ahead and get started, um, but first I want to uh, take the opportunity to just make a quick dedication to a couple of people um, who have been affected um, by this and their families. 
first um, is my cousin Erica, who was right around 40, 40 43 years old. And uh, she passed away as a result of complications from the COVID virus, um, just gone too soon. And then even more uh, heart wrenching because she was a family member, but this this uh, this child, just a, a princess that hadn't even begun to live her life, uh, five year old uh, Skylar Herbert uh, of Detroit, who uh, passed away as a result of contracting the uh, the COVID virus. And um, I, I'm very uh, very good friends with her dad. He's a firefighter. Her mom is a police officer. So it just it just goes to show you that that no one is is immune from this and it affects everybody. So I just want to take a minute to, to uh, um, dedicate this my portion of the program to them and as well as the whole program itself. So thank you very much. So um, I'm ready. And as Lula has stated before, um, the information that we're presenting is based basically uh, just um, information that is for um, awareness level. Um, we're not doctors. I'm not a doctor, even though I might play one on television, uh, but I'll do my best to give you the information that I have. So let's talk a little bit about how this uh, virus is spread or the COVID-2. So um, one of the things that happens is when people sneeze or when they cough, Usually what happens is there are large droplets of, of mucus, of saliva, of whatever they have transmitted from their body that comes from them. What happens is those larger droplets will fall to the ground after they're being expelled, which means they're no longer a real risk because they've fallen to the ground and they have no uh, real harm that they can do to you from that perspective. But the other part that what, what happens from this is that there is a small bit of the actual mist or the, uh, the, the offshoot of the, the sneeze or the cough that will linger in the air for three hours or more. And that depends on what type of environment or what type of situation you're in. That can go, it has thought that it can go as far as six feet, but right now we don't even know that it will only go six feet. And there are studies that show that it goes even further. So the droplets fall to the ground, but then what's left over from that sneeze or that cough can travel in the air and can stay in the air for three hours or more, which means that if you come in contact with that airborne transmission or the aerosol of it, that you can be infected. So we now, we, we've called this the novel uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it's what it is, it's a part of the SARS family, so to speak, which is a severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it's new. Reason it's called novel is because it's new. It's something that we have never experienced before in our lifetime. And because of that, it spread so easily from person to person. It was thought that it was something that was spread from uh, animals to humans, but we've seen that it's not necessarily that's that's not necessarily true, but it goes from one person to the other. And because it's so new and there's so little, there's a lot of information out there, but there's so many unknowns, there hasn't been a chance for us as humans to actually build up any type of immunity. For example, if you catch a cold or if you get the flu or if you get other some, type, some other type of virus, after you've gotten that virus, usually when you get over it, you build up an immunity to it. But because this is so new and there's there's uh, so much we don't know about it, we do know that there is uh, no immunity right now that's built up, even for those who have recovered. We're not sure if they will actually be able to not catch it again because there have been some cases where people have, it seems as though they have caught it again. So um, now this is just talking about the, the, uh, the transmission itself, how it's, it's transmitted. We've got droplets, which are the respiratory secretions that, that come from coughing or sneezing. And then you get an aerosol, which means it's a solid particle. So that's a small particle that can be suspended in air for a, a period of time that you can actually come in contact with. And that's how you can get infected. Now, the other ways that you can get infected is through touching uh, something that has SARS-2 on it. And then if you touch your mouth, your nose, and your eyes, and just think about this, how often do you subconsciously touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth without even realizing it. As I was sitting here listening to Lula's presentation and listening to, to uh, uh, Reverend Melvin, President Melvin, 
I had to actually uh, consciously make sure that I wasn't touching my nose or my eyes. And I found myself doing it unconsciously because of something that we're so used to. We have to start thinking of, of a new normal of how we, 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 we live our lives and we can no longer do that. Other ways that this can enter your body is through fecal matter, um, which um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, in a second, which is not the most pleasant way to enter your body, but it can enter your body in that way. Uh, but I do want to share something with you very quickly. Um, I was watching the Today Show last week, and there was the virologist, his name was Dr. Jeffrey Fair, who, uh, working in one of the New York City hospitals, has been fighting on the front lines, dealing with COVID, uh, treating patients, and he was leaving New York to head to New Orleans, I guess, where his home is. Well, he gets on the plane, he's got on his his uh, respiratory protection, his face mask, he's got on his gloves, he sanitizes the area around him completely. But there was a couple of things that were going on that were a little disconcerting. First of all, the plane that he got on was crowded, it was maxed out, it was supposed to be social distancing. So there was a lot of people on the plane. The other thing was that uh, while he was on the plane, he uh, didn't have any type of protection or anything that was covering his eyes. So once he got home, he noticed within a few days that he, be, he became sick. And after staying home for so long, he actually went to the hospital, went to the doctor, and he uh, went ahead and found out that he had contracted COVID-2. Um, and he suspects that he may have contracted it through his eyes because his eyes had not been protected. Now, here's the other part of this story. Um, he had been tested four times with four different types of tests that have been used out there that are on the market, one of which they use in the hospital. And every one of those tests came back negative um, for the COVID, even though he knew he had it and he had all of the, the symptoms and everything, it came back negatively. So what he thinks happened is that at the point in time in which he was tested, that his body had started to release the virus to a point where it was no longer showing up in his bloodstream or whatever other tests that they uh, conducted on him. So it was just very disturbing. He has since gone home, but he still thinks that that was one of the ways that he caught the virus was through his eyes because we know that that is a route of transmission. So we have to be careful in all ways about what we do. So when we talk about routes of, routes of exposure, um, we, we talk about contact with people and objects, the oral fecal route or ingestion, um, which is uh, probably not the most pleasant way that you can get it, but it could happen in any number of ways, depending on what you come in contact with, which you touch. We don't know what is on any of the surfaces that we're touching, especially uh, when we go into different places. Coughing and sneezing, it can inhale. That's one of the easiest ways for things to enter our body is through inhalation. So that is one of the things that we have to be concerned with as well. And then you have blood and mucous membrane. I wanna share another story with you now. Anybody who knows me, they'll tell you I have a million and one stories, but I'm not gonna tell them all tonight. I was in the uh, supermarket just this past weekend. I went back to Cincinnati. I, I'm, I'm in Detroit, uh, is where my family is. And I went back to Cincinnati uh, just to check on things. I have a, a, a residence there that I stay in when I'm working. So as I went to Cincinnati, I stopped at Kroger. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to mention the store. But anyway, I stopped at a supermarket, let's just say that. And as I'm checking out and I'm getting ready to pay for my items, there was a young man, I think he was being trained, he was on the job. Well, just as he was about to start ringing up my items, he sneezes and he kind of sneezes like this. So I waited and I've kind of looked at him for a second and I just waited for him to do something with his hands as far as like using a hand sanitizer. So I said, well, you know what? I need to bring this to his attention. I said, you know, uh, you just sneezed, right? He said, yes. I said, do you have any hand sanitizer? Oh, well, yeah, they have some right here, but normally it's, they have some, but it's not here. And so he looked like he was getting ready to continue to, or start to ring up my items. I said, you mean to tell me that you don't have any hand sanitizer anywhere? Well, he reaches around and he finds a bottle of hand sanitizer and he takes it, he rubs it on his hand. But if had, had I not said anything, he would have gone ahead, touched every one of my items with the hand that he sneezed on. And not only that, 
he took his hand or his finger and kind of wiped it across his nose before he was going to ring up my items. I won't tell you what I was thinking because this is a family show and we can't use that kind of language. <laughs> right. But I just wanted to let him know that you will not be touching my items before you put something on your hands to sanitize your hand, which he did and I left. But he also had on a surgical mask, which he was not wearing properly, and it was sitting below his nose and only covering his mouth. So that's another way that people are still getting this virus because they're not adhering to all of the safety rules and all the things they should do. So it's just, just something to think about. Be careful of, of where you are and what you're doing and make sure everybody's taking those precautions. So um, how long does this virus actually survive outside of your body? If you look here, we have uh, some surfaces here, some of the most common surfaces that people come in contact with, and we're talking about the half-life. So if it's an aerosol, it's gonna last about an hour. If it touches copper, then it's gonna last about a half hour, three hours for cardboard, six hours for stainless steel, and seven hours for plastic. So here's the thing though. When we talk about the half-life, basically what we're saying is that once this time period has passed, Let's take stainless steel, for example, or let's take cardboard because we're, we're, a lot of people are getting packages, they're going to the store, they're buying things, they're getting things from all kinds of delivery services. So it's gonna last for three hours. After that three hour period of time, if you think about it, you still have half of the virus that is present on that particular surface. So that means that you should still be handling that with some type of gloves, you should still be disinfecting those particular surfaces because they are still an, enough of a viable amount of the virus that could actually infect you. So you want to take the time to make sure that you're taking all the necessary precautions. The other thing you want to take also before I close um, is that and to understand is that depending on where you are and what type of environment you're in, that Anytime that the virus is airborne and aerosolized or uh, it's been transmitted through the air, it can last for three hours or more, especially if there is not a constant flow of air that is going through this particular place. So if you're in a house or someplace that's closed in, that virus is going to live for a longer period of time. So please be careful out there, be safe, stay healthy, do the right things, wear the, your PPE the way you're supposed to, put your face mask on properly and wear those gloves. And thank you very much. Thanks, Roy. Uh, we're so grateful for your insight and for valuing the lives of Black people and other communities marginalized by power and bias. Now I'm gonna ask uh, Lula and Roy to respond to questions from some frontline workers who disproportionately, disproportionately come from our zip codes. Uh, we see the are cheered and as essential workers who expose themselves and their families to higher health risks than other workers, but are denied hazard pay for their sacrifice. They're forced to choose between making a living and protecting their families, insufficient or low pay, little or no benefit, health care or pension, but now they are essential. We know them all. We know them well. They're in our families, our neighborhoods, and in our prayers. They're the nurses, the doctors, the LPNs, the janitors, the sanitation workers, the fast food workers, the grocery baggers, cashiers, postal workers, corner store workers, home health aides, delivery drivers, and migrant workers who are unfairly stigmatized. Uh, we have a couple questions that I just wanna ask if you guys could answer for us. Uh, we have a question from uh, Cynthia Stevens, a CVTU member and teacher from Detroit. Cynthia says, uh, what can people do if their water isn't clean to help protect against COVID-19? Who okay, wants to I'll take ta that? Lula, Roy? I'll, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, Michigan, you know, is unique because of the Flint uh, water situation. Now, in that particular case, they were talking about the water wasn't good for you to drink. It was unhealthy for you if you drank it. But related to the COVID-19, even that water is okay as long as they're using 
soap and water and doing it at least 20 seconds and doing it as often as they can. They'll be okay. I also wanna take the opportunity to say, we are very fortunate in the United States to have water even at the level of where Flint is. Not saying we're fortunate to have that debacle, but there are over 800,000 uh, people in the world that don't have access to clean running water. So every time you turn the faucet on here, just be thankful that you've got water that is clean and the majority of it, we can even drink it. So that is the one way they can do it because even using the hand sanitizer, as soon as you can, according to our bloodborne pathogen standard, you need to go somewhere to a wash station and wash your hands with warm soap and water. And even cold water, if you can't, don't have it, uh, warm water accessible to you, and that'll be fine. Roy? Uh, that's that's absolutely right, and um, it's it's uh, it's very vital and important to make sure that you are washing your hands. I, I wash my hands religiously uh, every day, and even before mm -hmm. this started. And and here's the thing: I think a lot of the things that we are being compelled to do now are things that we should have been doing already. Yeah. Um, and I think if we would have been doing those things uh, before now we might not see as many viruses or infectious diseases or things happening in society where people are, are getting sick and, and things are being spread so easily. So take the time to, to think about not only yourself, but think about uh, people who you come in contact with. Um, make sure that you have done what you're supposed to do, do your due diligence. Before I go to the restroom, uh, when I go to the restroom, I wash my hands mm -hmm. right when I walk in the door. And I wash my hands right afterwards. And instead of touching that faucet again to turn the water off, I take that piece of paper towel or hand towel and use it to turn the water off. And I will take it and use it to open the door before I leave out because of the fact that I don't know who's been touching that and what kind of uh, germs or whatever they have that they could be spreading. We all need germs to a certain extent, to a certain degree, mm -hmm. because they do help us to build up a certain immunity. But with this new virus that we're experiencing right now, it goes way beyond that. And we can't afford to uh, get lax in what we're doing. So people, please continue to be diligent and don't start relaxing because we do get, get complacent and we, we, uh, we sometimes we drop the ball. So please continue So, so Roy and Lula, quick follow-up question. Is it possible to use too much hand sanitizer? Um, go ahead, Lula. I don't, you... I don't <laughs> think so. What you need to do though is hydrate because mm -hmm. uh, it, has, it has all the alcohol, at least 60% for it in order for it to be effective. So that's drying in itself. So just make sure that you're hydrating uh, with, with a good uh, lotion or something every time you get through. I do wanna say this too, uh, it wasn't part of the question, uh, President Melvin, but please get you some disposable gloves when you go and pump your gas. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. You pick up a lot of germs off that. Clean your hands when you get back in your car. Just on that handle, just think about the many people that stop to get gas every single day. And they're touching and people do things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's they that's, do, a, that's a very nice, that's a nice <laughs> way of putting it, Lula. But, but one sure. of the points that, that I think both of you made is, is a lot of this stuff is things that people should have been doing all that's along. Right. I mean, washing your hands, I mean, being clean on a regular basis, taking care of yourself. And I'll give you one quick antidote before I move on to the next question. When this first started, my wife and I went to the store. We could not find any hand soap. We couldn't find no bar soap. We couldn't mm -hmm. find toilet paper. We like, before this, was anybody washing <laughs> their behind? And, you know, I mean, what happened? All of a sudden, the stores is out of all the cleanest stuff. So uh, it, it is just telling that you know, maybe this is just a wake up call. I think I always say something good comes out of everything bad and this might be the good change in this behavior. Yes. But uh, moving on to the next question. Our next question has come from uh, Joanna Barté who is a uh, LPN in New Orleans uh, and she got a tongue twister for me. She wants to know, she's an LPN, right? Uh, which testing is most appropriate now with the increase in symptomatic patients? Uh, Nasopharyngeal or biot <laughs> testing? The nasal I test. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or buyout justice. Uh, is there a prediction of COVID being a seasonal infection like influenza since it mimics the flu so closely? Okay, so you have two questions. That's so clear. Nasopharyngeal. Nas nasal, <laughs> na my wife said nasopharyngeal. Yeah, and she's okay, a nurse she corrected too. me. Yes, she's yes. an Yes, she's, she's a nurse corrected. as well. Okay, so there are two different tests, and one is the the. Uh, is she still saying she said something no, she, else? She, 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 yeah, yeah, she. Okay. <laughs> hey, um, the first part of her uh, question is a serology test. That's the one that they're using. as the one where they take the blood. And mm -hmm. basically what that does, it, um, there's an increase in the demand in order to quantify those patients that have had the COVID-19. So they do the blood test, which means you would have already had to have been infected for that to be uh, the case. So that is the one that is most preferred over the one, the nasal, where they take a Q-tip about this long, mm -hmm. kid you not, and they stick it up your nose all the way down and uh, to the back of the throat in order to see if you have the virus. That's a diagnostic test. So to answer our question, the first one would be the serology test would be the best one in this particular case. Uh, the second part of her, um, and that second test is called the RT-PCR, uh, diagnostic test. The one where they stick the Q-tip up, the long Q-tip up your nose. Okay. Um, it's a, a good prediction uh, that seasonal flus will bring on additional calls, but they don't have enough evidence about this particular virus to say if it's gonna mimic that. They don't have enough evidence about even the flu to say if it does it. It's just in North America, we're a colder climate. So we have a tendency to get colds and things and they say it's seasonal, but a lot of it depends on your immune system, the host, the environment that you're in, how healthy you are. <laughs> There are a lot of other variables that go along with this. The thing about this virus, this COVID-19 is, it's mutating very slowly, but there's so many different var variations of it. It's just a lot of it's still silent. They don't really know what to do with it too much. So every day it's a different kind of things that's coming, uh, that comes up about this virus. Uh, we do have a tendency to get, it looks like we get more colds. If you take, um, but a myth buster, the SARS, they said in the summertime, the SARS went away. It did not go away. What happened is what we're doing right now, practicing isolation, quarantine, and the social distances is what eradicated that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that it was in the summer months. So it's important that we do that even after we get through this curve and we will get through this. And on the other side, eventually, we will get through it. But it's important to keep that in mind and also the washing of the hands. It's just simple. Those, those things, if you do that, we can survive it. And all of us can come out on the other side still standing up on two feet. All right, great, great. Roy, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, one, one thing, just a, well, a couple of things. But one of the things is that um, what was found out is that initially when the, when the virus first uh, became so prevalent and it was uh, going, running rampant through uh, society, they were saying that it was people who were older and people who had compromised immune systems were really the only ones that had to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And Lula just said something that's very key um, that is mutated slowly, but it's gotten to a point where now everybody is at risk. It's no longer just uh, people who are, are, are older, uh, and it's no longer people who have compromised immune systems. We're seeing people who are very healthy. Uh, the gentleman that I mentioned earlier, the virologist, Dr. Fair, 42 years old, works out five to six times a week, um, had no underlying health conditions, and he was still struck with this particular virus. Uh, we've seen children now. We've seen a, a, an alarming rate now of of children being affected yeah. and it's now starting to take on a different type of form as to how it's affecting them. Um, that's one of the reasons why I dedicated um, this to uh, Skylar Herbert because up until that time, there was no five-year-old child or anybody um, who contracted this, this virus who had passed away. So we're mm -hmm. seeing that this, this thing is, is changing uh, at, at such a, a rate that it's hard for us to keep up with it um, because there's so many different things going on. The, the testing also, um, and this is just some, some information that I read 
and have heard, um, and again, like I said, I'm not a doctor, play one on TV at night, but I'm not a doctor, um, that um, some of the tests that are out there, you have to be careful which test you use mm -hmm. because of the fact that they were putting out so many tests initially because they were trying to get ahead of the virus. A lot of these tests, and I can't tell you which ones, were not necessarily approved by the FDA. That's right. So that's a danger in itself because you don't know, are you getting something that's giving you the right information and the right answer and telling you what you need to know as to whether or not you have been affected by this virus? Thank, thanks so much, Roy. Uh, great questions. And uh, later, we're going to try to take a few questions from the folks in our chat room. Uh, but we're going to, uh, now we're going to move on to do a little bit of uh, myth busting. Since uh, COVID-19 put America on lockdown, facts and opinions have gotten blurred, even as we have just talked about. Uh, that has led to confusion and people making bad choices. Take the myth pushed by the current occupant of the White House. Remember when he told Americans, sane <laughs> Americans, they should drink some disinfectant or some bleach to get rid of the coronavirus? Y'all don't. Don't even try <laughs> that deadly cocktail. Your family will be driving past your casket wearing masks if you fall for that insane myth coming from the White House, or as I've been known to call it, the House of White Insanity. Peyton is going to take us through some uh, other COVID-19 myths that are floating around, and Lula and Roy will try to clear, the, clear away the fog for us. Peyton? Thank you, sir. Um, can we have the slides put up? All right, here we go. So this is one of the parts that I've been looking forward to the most. Um, and so essentially how this is gonna go, I'm gonna read uh, just a little bit off the slide and then I'm gonna ask for Roy and Lula to give us some feedback and help us deconstruct these myths, right? Some of these things have been like just floating around our community. The first one. So y'all are telling me that 5G mobile networks is not the cause of the COVID-19 spread? Uh, no. As you can see, Viruses cannot travel on radio waves. There's a lot of that going on saying it was a conspiracy and it was a way for, the, for them to, to kill us. The 5G is just, uh, now some of the rays may be harmful in other ways, but it won't, uh, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the virus. That's a myth. The, the, the only way your 5G mobile phone or uh, network is going to affect you with the virus is if you get it on your phone and you don't sanitize your phone. And that's, that's another right. thing because, I mean, seriously, I mean, what's, what's the right. number one thing that we touch all the time that we keep in our hand? That's right. Mm -hmm. We take, we, I, I'm just going to say this. We take our phones with us everywhere. And then I'm yeah. going to leave that alone. Right. Yeah. The question of fecal matter, how that gets in the play, I, right? I, I like, went to, see, I said, right. I just said, oh. I wasn't going there, Peyton. I just said, we take it everywhere. <laughs> hey, you know. Wow. Yeah. Um, come get the next slide, please. So, um, exposing yourself to the sun or the temperatures higher than 25 degrees Celsius does not prevent nor cure COVID-19. So y'all telling me that if I go outside and it ain't hot enough, it ain't going to burn the virus straight up about me. Uh, no, what you're going to do is get heat stroke or heat exhaustion and you would be dead. That would cure the virus. <laughs> <laughs> no. However, if it's on a dry surface, on a serious note, uh, just so happens that maybe somebody coughed and the virus got on a dry surface. If it's on that dry surface and it's out in the sun long enough, it will sort of get rid of that on a dry surface, surface, mm -hmm. but not on you as an individual. Okay, just like the ultraviolet light swans. As, as a matter of fact, they may cause you some harm because mm -hmm. that was a question as well in some way. Okay, uh, can we get the next slide, please? So myth number three, house flies can transmit the virus. True or false? Uh, that's false, um, that house flies can, um, can give you the virus. House flies can do a number of other things um, because of what they come in contact with and the types of, of conditions under which they exist but they cannot transmit the virus to you. 
But I will say this, if you got that many flies in your house, you've got some other issues besides worrying about the virus. There's some other things you need to be taken care of. I'm, I'm like President Melvin because now where was everybody at when, you know, now everybody's buying up all the toilet tissue mm -hmm. and everything. So if you got that many house flies, we, we got other issues going on and, and I will not be coming <laughs> to your house for the Memorial Day cookout. <laughs> I'd be eating at your place. Absolutely. Not, you're not going to even touch the potato salad. No. Not at all. <laughs> I pass. I'd be a vegetarian. All right. Can we get the next uh, slide, please? So, all right. This one has to be true. Mosquitoes. Um, we know that mosquitoes uh, pass around the Zika virus. Uh, we know that it's been rumored that mosquitoes can pass along other uh, uh, blood pathogens. So this one has to be true, right? Uh, no, I think probably people had that question because of the Zika virus. Um, there are approximately 3,500 different kinds of mosquitoes worldwide. About 170 of them are indigenous to the United States and different mosquitoes carry different viruses. That is not one of them that's carried uh, by a mosquito. Okay, but I'm pretty sure it came up because of the Zika uh, virus. All right, so we have one more myth to bust. All right, let me get it. All right, so I'm under the impression that if I eat something spicy enough or enough spicy food, that that'll burn the virus away from the inside out, right? Well, I'd be glad to let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew you would. Um, that's not true. Um, you might have some uh, indigestion, but you will still have the virus. Um, it's, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to help anything. A lot of these things are based on, uh, for lack of a better term, old wives tales uh, mm -hmm. that we've heard over the years that people have told us that we, you know, people still uh, uh, hold on to and they think that they're true and they're not necessarily so. But um, the, the best thing that you can do um, instead of eating extremely hot, spicy food, but if that's your choice, be, be my guest, go, go for sure. it, um, is to get regular exercise, um, try to get enough rest, make sure that you're eating properly, try to build up your immune system more so through those measures as opposed to trying to use some quick remedy that somebody gave you that they have no idea whether or not it actually works. So I think that's something that's very important right now, um, especially since we're all quarantined, take the time to make some life changes. You know, if you're not getting enough rest, if you're not mm -hmm. exercising, uh, if you're not eating properly, these are the things that we should be doing because of the fact that now that we're home, we can cook more. We can actually uh, spend more time uh, actually resting instead of having to run around 24 hours a day. But so you want to make sure you're doing those things. But no, the, the spicy food is not going to help you. Um, it's just going to, like I said, give you indigestion among <laughs> other things. Okay, so the burners ain't going to work either, right? <laughs> no, burners is not going to work either. <laughs> Um, and and I, I'm I'm sorry, but I am just gonna go here. Um, and neither will uh, some of your um... <laughs> liquor. Okay, yeah, I was not gonna say <laughs> liquor, but yeah, liquor. Yeah. And some people think that. Now, I I attempted to test that theory out a few weeks ago, um, and found out that that it was it was a myth. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that if you if you want to make some hand sanitizer, go find yourself a uh, uh, right. a bottle of uh, Bacardi 151. That's about right. 73 percent alcohol by volume. Mm, that okay. will definitely give you something to sanitize your hands. With. Wow. <laughs> so, so like you can sanitize kill your soul with that one. <laughs> So yeah, kill you, the virus on your hand, but not inside you. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Pretty much, pretty much, pretty much, President Melvin. <laughs> well, thank you, Roy and Lula. Um, that wraps up the myth uh, busting that we have. And I just wanted to make a note for the audience out there that all the slides that you've seen today will be available on our website, and I will share links for that at the end of this uh, podcast and dialogue, so you all can know where to go to uh, to get some of this information. Um, and I think President Melvin, we have time for one question from YouTube before we wrap. 
Yeah, we'll do we'll do the one question. I just want to say to uh, Roy, you just lost your uh, fist bump. Uh, you just blew that <laughs> myth. Uh, everybody that knows President Melvin know that I just love hot sauce, and if that was my saving grace, now you done took that from me. I cannot <laughs> save from Corona freaking my hot sauce by the gallon. Uh, let's get to the the one question. Uh, Jose uh, Rosado uh, asked, yeah, when you find that the workplace plan that is in place is not being followed, can you refuse to work? And, and I, I think he left off and still have your job. Yes. <laughs> Where you want to get it? Well, um, I, I want to make sure that I answer this correctly because you want to be careful under which circumstances that you refuse to work and the reason why you refuse to work. Um, it has to be a valid reason. Um, if they do not have a plan in place, then that's one of the things that you as a worker want to try to get yourself involved in. How can we put a plan in place? And I'm not sure exactly what type of workplace plan he was talking about, if it's an exposure control plan or uh, if it's any other type of health and safety plans. A lot of times what happens is if there is no work plans in place or health and safety plans or anything of that nature, um, people will form committees, which will be between the union members and between the employer um, that will try to come together and do something. The thing that you want to do is you want to make sure, again, if, if you're going to refuse to work, make sure that you are doing it under the right conditions that is going to make sure that you're protecting yourself, first of all and make sure that you will be able to uh, have your job once this is over. You can't just refuse to work just because you don't wanna do the job. If there's an issue of health and safety, uh, where it comes to a point where you could lose your life or something of that nature, then you may be able to re, um, refuse work. But again, you have to make sure that you follow the right protocol. That's if right. there's not a workplace plan in place, you also wanna make sure that you give the employer an opportunity to uh, maybe put one together. And here's the thing, a lot of times when you do these things you and you get information and you go back and you go to training classes and you find out things, you're gonna be educating your employer a lot of times because right. it, it may not be that they don't wanna do it, it just may be that they don't know. So you have to make sure that you're giving them the correct information and using that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Uh, time really flies when you're getting good information uh, and uh, let me just say it, as a pin to that, if, you, if you're in a unionized environment, call your local union first right. and find right. out what their advice is on that question that just came up from Jose. I'd like mm -hmm. to give a big shout out to our viewers for engaging this important conversation about mm -hmm. a deadly health crisis, something we haven't seen in, in 100 years. Your voice and your feelings about COVID-19 and many other issues will tell us what is the real pulse in our communities and in our unions. Once again, I want to thank Peyton and our outstanding guests, Lula Oden and Roy McAllister for a great kickoff for our podcast series. Contact uh, for Roy and Lula, as well as additional information and more myth busting can be found on the CBTU website. I urge everybody to follow CBTU on our website, www.cbtu.org as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Because as they say on the farm, we're toiling the soil. That's right. We're working on a new playbook for liber uh, liberation. I hope you can join us for our next episode, Labor Shift, the best 60 minutes on the clock. We'll be uh, looking at the issue of black economics during post COVID-19. Uh, during and post COVID-19 in our next session, which will be in a couple weeks. So look for it, go to our website, stay engaged. Thank you for being here. And thank you again to our guests. Thank you for inviting us. It's been thank enjoyable. you so much. Thank you so much, President Melvin, for having me. I appreciate it. And we're gonna get some hot wings so we can, so we can uh, fist bump uh, <laughs> later on. All right. <laughs>